need it. And uh, but just immediately following, we'll head out there. Hey, God, thanks for this chance we have of being together this morning. Thank you for what we've already learned. And now, Lord, as we just spend a few moments together thinking about CCDA, I just pray that you would help us to focus on who you are and what you're calling us to do in our lives. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're talking about the past, the present, and the future. And it, it, it's, something, it is, it's an amazing thing that we actually have a chance to do that. You know, we, we actually do have a past in CCDA. And this, we're really 21 years old right now. 1989 it began. You've heard that over and over again. You're probably tired of hearing about that. But we have a past, and, and we remember that, and we build upon it. And then we have, a, we have a present, and we rejoice in what God is doing. And God is doing wonderful things. And then we're trying to reimagine what the future could be like. Now, let me just say, we are committed in CCDA to being learners. Go to the people. Live among them, learn from them. And it's so important that we are learners. That's why we, we have books and that's why we, we, we have so many things that will help us to do that. Every summer I take a study leave and, and I, I've, it's kind of been my tradition recently to tell you a little bit about that. But I want to just show you four or five books I read this summer. One is a CCDA book, When Helping Hurts. Highly recommend that. And then another one is by Jim Collins. It's not a Christian book, but it's about when the mighty fall. And, and it's, 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 a, it's a classic work in business and why businesses fall, but I think as ministries, we can learn a lot from that also. Then there's this book that's, it's a, I really want you to read this book. It's called Unchristian. The title comes from what young people in America think of. When they think of us as Christians, they think of us, that they use one word to describe us, they use the word unchristian. We as Christians are unchristian in the way we act. So we need to work at that and think a little bit about that. Also, uh, N.T. Wright. I had the opportunity to spend four days with N.T. Wright. And, to, and, to, and to with, there were four, uh, ten theologians and ten uh, practitioners. And, of course, I was a practitioner. We spent three days together thinking and talking and debating and, and understanding. And, and his book, Simply Christian, is just a classic book by N.T. Wright. If you've never read anything by him, and I would encourage you to read that. But what I want to think with you today is not so much, I, 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 want to I want to draw the past into the present and think a little bit with you about the future. I want to do all of these things together. You are CCDA. I mean, the, you, you may not feel it today, you may not recognize that, but I want you to know that you right here present, not just these leader cohort up here, but every one of you here, you are CCDA. And together, we are CCDA. This is what it's all about. Now, in, in the midst of CCDA, what I want to think with you today is I want to think about five CCDA commitments. There are some things that we are committed to. There are some things that, we, that we, we're going we're gonna to draw the line in the sand in some areas, and we are committed to live as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have some commitments to what that is all about. I want to go over those with you. I want it to be clear what CCDA is. This is not just people doing ministry among the poor. This is not just uh, urban ministry. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's an association of people who are committed to some things. And so our first commitment is that we're committed to the struggle. We are committed to the... I, I like what Brenda said. We have such a great foundation, of course, with John and Vera Mae Perkins. This foundation that they laid for us. In 1970, when John was on, on, in the Brandon jail and he was beaten, Vera Mae, I don't know, probably 20, 20, over 20 years ago, Vera Mae and I were on that road together. We were driving down to see one of her grandchildren, and it was just Vera Mae and me in the car. And she says, she said, Wayne, pull over right here. She said, this is where they picked up JP. And we sat there, we talked about it, and she told me the story from her viewpoint and how she thought her husband was dead. There's a struggle. You may not have been beaten in a Brandon jail, but I know literally hundreds of you. I've been to many of your ministries. I wish I had been walked a day with every one of you in this room. I really do. But I know that it's a struggle. I know that some of you right now, you came to CCDA and you got some issues back in your ministry. You're not even sure if you can continue on. This, this, this is a struggle. 
Now, when we think about the past, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. It's hard for me. I've had a really hard year. These last two years in my life may have been the hardest two years of anything I've ever done in my life. There's pain. There's struggle. I'm not going to name them for you today. You name your own. But I, I want you to know I, I feel your pain. I know that it's hard. What we are trying to do is, is not very many people do it. That's why I said on the panel yesterday, let's not let this be a fad. Let's not just because everybody's talking about social justice and Beck says if you were in a church that talks about social justice, get up and walk out. I mean, people are talking about social justice these days. I don't even care if you talk about social justice. We know who we are at CCDA and I, you are out there on the front lines in the trenches and let me tell you, I know that it's hard. I still live in Lawndale. We've had more people shot and killed. The first three months of the year, more people were shot and killed in Chicago than Afghanistan and Iraq altogether. I mean, this is a war zone. A man across the street from me murdered right there on the sidewalk. I mean, I know what you're going through, and I know it's hard. And that's why we're an association, that we come together to feel each other's pain, to share with one another, and that somebody might understand us. The very first CCDA conference, my president's keynote address, the title of it was, It Ain't Easy, But It Can Happen. I had been in Lawndale 15 years when we had that first conference. And I remember giving that talk almost like it was yesterday. And I remember having my points laid out there. And I remember, and my line was, it ain't easy, but it can happen. It ain't easy, but it can happen. And I shared struggles that I was going through. I remember that first CCDA conference. There's only about 150 in the room at Lawndale Community Church that night. On Saturday night, I gave the president's, I was elected president in the afternoon. And they said, you got to give a president's address at night. But I'm ready in season and out, let me tell you. But my heart was, it ain't easy, but it can happen. I want you to know that we know that. We know that it ain't easy what you're doing. It ain't easy to cross racial barriers. It ain't easy to relocate. And it's harder to relocate maybe for an African American to relocate back into a poor African American community than it is for a white person to do that. It's tough. It ain't easy. But I want you to know, I believe you are, you are really wonderful people. As I talk to you in the hallway, as I sit and talk, and I, I, you know, I, I, I want to talk to all of you, I really do. I want you to know how I really believe how you are some fantastic people. And, and, I, and I, I, I thank you for what you're doing from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I don't need to preach at you. I don't need to get you on the right track. I'm not here to set you straight. I want you to know that you are a fantastic person to do what you're doing, to come and be a part of CCDA, and I thank you for what you're doing. And so that first commitment that we have is we are committed to stay in the struggle, and it's hard for all of us. It ain't easy, but it can happen. The second thing is commitment to family. And you know, at that very first, at that very first conference again, when we look back at the past, we see that Bob Lupton gave a keynote address. And Bob Lupton brought family to the forefront. Not just a bunch of, of men who are trying to do ministry, but brought family right in among us. And he shared the struggles of his own family, things that he was struggling with with his wife Peggy at the time, and raising two boys in the city. CCDA has been committed to family, and we are committed. We're committed to you to help you. The workshops that we have of helping people to, to navigate the systems and to work through things, and the family issues, it's hard. It's hard for the, for the families that are growing up in your neighborhoods, and, and everybody has told them, is to be successful is to move out and get out of Lawndale. But when that family decides to stay, that's hard, that's difficult. But we're committed to family. We're committed to family. Ann and I raised our three children in Lawndale. And, I, and, and, and Angela and Andrew and Austin. 
And, and I, I'm amazed at them. They teach me things every day. Our daughter Angela is teaching in Lawndale now. She teaches in a school in Lawndale. Andrew mentors a boy in Lawndale every week, spends time with him. And Austin's in his senior year of college. But we've ra- and it's been hard. There's been difficulties. But we want to talk about the struggles. Some of you homeschool, fine. Some of you send your kids to the local public school a block from your house, great. Some of you send your kids to a magnet school, that's fine. Some of you send your kids to a suburban school, that's okay. We are not here to judge how you do something. We know you're in the struggle. And we are committed to family. As a matter of fact, this is, this is, in the, this is the dedication of my, my most recent book to my wife, Anne. I, I have the greatest wife in the world, and I know, I hope all of you men here feel the same, but I am so blessed to have Anne as my wife. She's not here, she's working today. But I want to read you what I wrote in my dedication to Anne. I said, I dedicate this book to my wonderful wife, Anne. We've partnered together for over 33 years. Anne and I share life together. We do ministry, friends, and family as one. She is exceeding and abundantly beyond whatever I hoped or dreamed of in a wife. I shudder to think where I would be without her. Anne is the love of my life, my best friend, and and the collaborator of my soul. I want you to have good families, and we're committed to that. Some of you know that Ten years ago, our family was going through some things. We moved out of Lawndale for three years. And CCDA was was good to us. You didn't just crucify us, even though we talk about relocation. So family, we're committed to family. And I want us to do that. We're also committed to a philosophy of ministry. Now that's very important. I want us to see this because we're not just urban ministry people. We're not just ministry to the poor in rural settings. We have a philosophy to do that. And of course, it started with John Perkins. But let, let, me, let me say this. John, the thing that John would be most upset with is if we build a movement around John Perkins. This is not a movement around John Perkins. John Perkins is our Moses. John has brought us here. John experienced these things, but John wants CCDA to continue after he's in glory with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so it's a philosophy of ministry that started with John, but then literally thousands of you have helped to develop what Christian community development is all about. We have a foundation but we're committed to a philosophy of ministry. John talked about the three R's this morning, but there's eight key components to Christian community development. Not all urban ministry, not all ministry among the poor is Christian community development. And we're not gonna water this thing down. We are committed to relocation, living in the community. We are committed to reconciliation and redistribution. We are committed to leadership development. As John said this morning, we're committed to raise up indigenous leaders in our community. Quit, you white folks that are here, every time you need a new leader, quit calling your college friends to come in and join you. Take somebody in the neighborhood, maybe a junior high boy or a high school girl, and begin to walk with them and just do the stuff that needs to get done now and so that 10 years from now, they can be the leaders in your community. It's too easy to go get somebody else out there. We are committed to raising up new generations of leaders within our community. That's the future. We're church-based. The church is very important. The church is the hope of the world, not CCDA. Christ is the hope of the world, and the church is the vehicle that that goes through. And then we want to listen to the community. The idea shouldn't come from you. Don't come to, don't come to CCDA and get an idea to go back and, and lay it on your people. No, we're teaching you to go back and listen to your community. Listen to them. They have the ideas. We say all the time the people with the problem have the best solutions to solve the problem. It's a holistic approach. It's not just one little thing. And also, it's something that empowers people. It helps people. CCDA's got a book on, Mary Nelson wrote on empowerment and what that looks like. 
so that people, we come alongside so that people can be the people God's called them to do. We have a, this Immerse, Immersion Institute coming up where we teach all eight com components of Christian community development. It's going to be in Chicago April 3rd through the 8th. You can go to page 12 in your program and hear more about it, but you can get a certificate in Christian community development through our institute. The fourth thing is we are committed to Christ. Unashamedly Christian, it's in our name, the Christian Community Development Association. We are committed to Jesus Christ. You know, we are going to stand for Christ, I'm going to stand for Christ, you're going to stand for Christ, and we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God for salvation. The moment we start stringing from our commitment to Jesus Christ is the moment that CCDA starts going down the wrong path. We are unequivocally committed to Jesus Christ. We are Christian in our bones and in everything that we do. John's been talking about the foundation of Jesus Christ laid on us. And, but we've got to put some flesh to that. The great commandment in Scripture, Matthew 22. Jesus asked the question, what's the most important commandment in all the Bible? What is the most important? Jesus answers, the most important command, the greatest command, is to love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. He says, love me with everything you have. We're called to be in love with God. It's the great commandment. The most important thing you do is not your programs. The most important thing you do is not living in the neighborhood. The most important thing you do is not working on being reconciled to people across racial lines. No, those, those things are important, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing we do is we love God. We love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind. And Mark and Luke add the word strength. We love God, it's the great command. We love God with everything we have. The last couple years I've been inviting you to make a commitment. Commit with me, with me to spend an hour alone with God every day. Mark 135 says very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went and spent alone time with the Father. Will you spend alone, an hour alone with God? Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Don't be such an activist that you miss your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We are committed to Christ, but it's not some intellectual commitment. It's a commitment of our whole being. Romans 12 says, that we would give our whole body in worship of God, everything that we have. So I encourage you, I beseech you, I actually beg you to spend an hour alone with your Lord Jesus Christ every day. Because the greatest commandment is to love God with everything we have. And so we are committed in CCDA to Jesus Christ. And then the fifth commitment is we're committed to our neighbor. In that same passage of scripture, you remember what it said. It said, Jesus said, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? But then what does Jesus say? He doesn't just say, he says, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and to love. Then he says, but there is a second in the Matthew text. It says, but there is a second one. There is something that I also want you to do. There is a second command, and he says, and it's just like the first. It's, he says, in other words, it's just as important as the first. And so the first commandment is to love God with everything we have. And then most of us put love our neighbor as ourself underneath it. And we kind of say, okay, it's priority number two. And we'll get to it when we can. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he said, and there is a second one that's just like the first. And when he says it's just like the first, he elevates it to the same plane. Loving our neighbor, it's the order that's significant. We love God first so that we have the strength that we might love our neighborhood, but it's not in significance. They are both the great commandment. Love God with everything we have, but then we also love our neighbor as we love ourselves. 
Now, we love people. At Lawndale, we just have, our, our, our mission statement is so simple. Loving God, loving people. Loving, to those of you that come out, you're going to see that all over the place. Loving God, loving people. That's what we're committed to do. To love other people. In the Luke passage, it's, it's a little bit switched, where there's an expert in the law that comes up to Jesus and says, hey, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And what does Jesus say? He says, well, you know the law. What do you think? He answered correctly. Well, I think you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And also love your neighbor as you love yourself. He had the answer down pat. Jesus said, you got it. That's right. Do this and you will live. You will have eternal life. But then if you look in the text there, verse 29, look what it says. It says, but he wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The text is very clear here. He wants to justify himself, which means he thought he was loving his neighbor. He thought he knew who his neighbor was, and he thought he was loving his neighbor. And so he says, oh, Jesus, just tell me who my neighbor is so that I can show you what a great guy that I am and how much I love my neighbor. He had a misconception of his neighbor. He thought his neighbor was the person that lived next door to him. He thought his neighbor was someone that had the same education that he had. He thought his neighbor was the same race, someone that looked like him, acted like him, smelled like him, tasted the same foods as he had. That's who he thought his neighbor was. And Jesus shocked him with his answer. And here in this Luke passage, Jesus said, no. He then tells the parable, the story of the Good Samaritan, where there was a man traveling down the road from Jerusalem and Jericho. And he was beaten, and he was left there half dead. And you know the story, and a priest passed by and didn't stop, and uh, Levi passed by and didn't stop. But there was this Jew on the road, beaten up until he's half dead. Stripped of his clothes, he was naked. And a Samaritan came along and stopped and put him on his donkey, took him to the inn, gave money to the innkeeper, take care of him. When I come back, I will help again. Now, most preachers, when they preach this story, I think do it somewhat incorrectly. They only focus their attention on the Samaritan. Now, I've spent the last 25 years of my life studying this passage of Scripture. This defines who I am. Because I've asked the question, who's the man beaten up on the side of the road? That's the person that we are called to love. That's my neighbor that I'm called to stop and help. That person on the side of the road. Who is our neighbor? Now, in my studies, I've put them into a book. And the title of the book is Who Is My Neighbor? There's 40 chapters. There's 40 chapters because, and, and I have tried my best to discipline myself in this Bible study that if it, if it made the book, it had to be a characteristic of the man beaten up on the side of the road. Who is the person beaten up on the side of the road? That's my neighbor. That's who I'm called to love. We've been talking about immigration here. Well, this was a foreign traveler, and quote unquote, as we call them, an illegal alien. But the Samaritan stopped and helped him. Leviticus 19 says, when you see the alien, you are to help them. And so we begin to do that. The man beaten up on the side of the road is someone that it took a risk to help because they might get beat up. It's somebody that needed help. It's somebody that was struggling. You know, you can, you can begin to see, but my neighbor is not the person that looks like me and acts like me and smells like me. My neighbor is that person that nobody else wants to help. Who do you know in your neighborhood that nobody wants to help? According to Jesus... That's who the man on the side of the road was. The priest and the Levite passed by. This is kind of my life work. Who is my neighbor? This book I just wrote just came out. It's actually not coming out until November, but we had a pre-release for CCDA. You know, this book is something I hope, I've prayed, I've been writing it for 20 years, and I've hoped and I've prayed that it would be a tool for the body of Christ, a tool for the kingdom, 
Not as much for you, maybe, as for others, that they would see that their neighbor is not the person that lives next door to them, not the person that looks like them, but the neighbor is like the person beaten up on the side of the road. These are our commitments at CCDA. Now, the book's available when you walk outside if you want it. But these are the most important commitments that we have, that we're committed to the struggle, and it is hard. We're committed to a philosophy of ministry. We're committed to God and to Jesus Christ. And we're committed to other people and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Can you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for every person here. Such, such a privilege to be in the same room with these sisters of the faith, with these brothers of the faith. And so, Lord, I just pray right now that you would be with each person in this room. Help us to be committed to our families to the struggle, to the philosophy, to you, our Lord, Jesus Christ, and to our neighbor and to all the people around us. Lord, I pray for my sisters and brothers here. I know that some of them are struggling today with some things going on in their own family, in their ministry, in their personal lives. Maybe they've sinned and they've fallen. Lord, I just lift each person up to you and help us to be who you called us to be. We commit CCDA to you and the next 20 years and that it would be what you would have us to be. Thank you for your great love for us. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's go and be CCDA. You're dismissed. <laughs>